Now, a couple key points were made from this movie. Was it that C3 mangroves easily outcompeted C4 salt grasses as CO2 rose because C3 plants are more sensitive to CO2 changes than C4 plants are? That was their initial hypothesis. Or did it end up that C4 salt marshes outcompeted C3 mangroves as CO2 rose, especially when nitrogen in the soil also increased? That was actually what happened. The point is, you come in with a simple hypothesis. These systems are very complicated. They were only looking at two species here, and the results were way more complex than you would have expected. Why would the scientists test the increased CO2 ecosystem response while also raising the amount of fixed nitrogen in the soil? The reason for that is because there is more fixed nitrogen being delivered today to the soils by industrial sources. So that's the key point here is that we do also see this nitrogen fertilization effect and that's why they introduced that parameter in their study. Another thing to consider is the polar migration of pests and disease. If the mid-latitude winters become less severe in the future from global warming, many more tropical insect species could survive there. Insect pests could expand their ranges. This would cost big money to combat this, and it could be a vector for disease as well. The potato leafhopper, a pest for soybeans, could expand the range from the Gulf of Mexico way farther north into the mid-latitudes. Or the Anisophilus mosquito, which is a malaria vector, could expand away from the tropics. This particular mosquito needs average winter temps greater than 61 degrees Fahrenheit, so it would take some time to get that in where we live in the middle latitudes here. More warming, there'd be more mosquitoes. More extreme weather, you tend to get more stagnant water pools, and then there's good breeding grounds for more mosquitoes. More extreme weather is predicted in the future. So thinking about stagnant water, are floods or droughts more likely to give more stagnant water? And the answer is that floods or droughts could do it. If you have a flood, you get pools of water in zones that don't typically have water. They become stagnant and they're breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Or you could have a drought that drags down the lakes to such a level, the inlets and outlets of the lakes are not as effective as oxygenating that water. And so then they become stagnant, again, breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So both processes could really do this. More of both floods and droughts are predicted in the future. Now this is looking at a past IPCC study where they have different scenarios than the one we looked at the IR5, but here we have an A2 scenario, which is basically the business as usual, unlimited population increase and self-reliant nations. The A1B scenario from the IPCC AR4 was a more integrated world, a balance of fossil fuels and alternative energy, population was capped at 9 billion people in 2050, and then B1 is kind of the best case scenario, much more integrated global network, more ecologically friendly in the future. So in general, as you go towards the greens here, you're emitting more CO2. So the upper graph is showing precipitation intensity. First, what has been observed, an uptick in precipitation intensity when it does rain, how hard does it rain, a little bit harder lately, and projecting into the future even harder and harder. And it is a function of how much fossil fuels and how much temperature increases. This is because as temperature increases from fossil fuels, you'd expect more evaporation, that gives you more water vapor, more water vapor will ultimately mean more precipitation in the future. So the more we emit, the more warming, the more general precipitation intensity. But also interestingly is the dry days. Here we're showing that in the future, we're projecting if we increase fossil fuels quite a bit, there will be more dry days in between those rain events. So this is how you could have both floods and droughts increase in the future. When it rains, it rains harder, and in between those rainy days, you'll have more dry days. So this could impact things like mosquito populations. But other things you might want to think about in Colorado, it certainly would affect wildfires too, because all of a sudden you get lots of rain, which grows the fuels really well, but then you don't see rain for weeks at a time, and then you have time for those fuels to dry out, and you might expect more wildfires as a result of those effects. Looking at the general water cycle predictions, the projections are for the tropics to get more moist, more rainfall there, the subtropics to expand poleward a little bit, and also dry out considerably, and also for the mid-latitudes in general to get more wet. And so this is just looking at precipitation. It's not looking at evaporation effects. Again, as you increase temperature, evaporation is going to increase quite a bit. So even though this is showing precipitation and wet regions essentially getting wetter and dry regions getting drier, you also have to look at things like the temperature and evaporation rates before you can figure out how much the land surfaces might moisten or dry out in the future. So this is just part of the scenario here. Now we can look at some aquatic ecosystem responses. 
Ocean acidification is very important, and I will leave that to a med-ed lesson that covers this very well. You can look at that following this lecture. Other things to think about would increase long wave radiation at the ocean surface in a region of weak upwelling act to increase or decrease the upwelling? And the answer is decrease. So essentially this means if you add greenhouse gases, you're adding more long wave radiation to the surface that's going to warm the sea surface temperatures. As you know from past lectures, if you have warm fluid on top of a colder fluid, that's a stable situation. It's harder to mix it up. So a region that might have very weak upwelling right now might be shut off if you increase the temperatures at the surface of that water column because now it's more stable and it can't upwell like it used to. Now I won't imply that really dynamic upwelling zones like the equatorial upwelling zones or the coastal upwelling zones will shut off because they have a strong wind pattern that forces that upwelling. However, zones that have very weak upwelling might stop upwelling as a result of warming the top layers of that water column. So in summary, warming the surface ocean can limit or change the location of upwelling zones and can certainly limit deep mixing in places like the high latitude oceans that currently have weak thermoclines that are easy to mix up with winds. So that impact is shown here, increased oceanic stratification, may limit upwelling and oceanic productivity. If you cut off the upwelling, you don't get as many nutrients to the surface, you won't get as much phytoplankton blooms or general primary productivity at the tops of the ocean. Another ocean impact is coral bleaching. This is the expulsion of symbiotic algae, mainly under heat stress. For example, the Great Barrier Reef right now is having a lot of warm water, and that's causing enormous coral bleaching events. However, you can also get coral bleaching from other methods like dust, cold, acidification, runoff, pollutants, low tides, sunscreen, and high solar radiation, otherwise sunburns of the coral reef. Here's what the polyps look like in a coral reef. A healthy coral has symbiotic algae that feed the animal polyps through photosynthesis on the coral. Interactions between those two, the coral and the symbiotic algae, generate the coral's brilliant colors. A bleached coral, what happens, either high water temperatures or those other effects I said, persist for a week or more. The polyps, the coral, will reject their plant partners and the coral will appear bleached. Without their symbiotic algae, first of all, they can't get fed but also they lose their color. If the heat or anomaly of any kind persists for too long, the corals well die. Dead coral, algae grows on top of the dead coral. These are not the symbiotic algae we need. These are other kinds of algae. It makes it impossible for new colonies to form there. If, however, it's a generally healthy reef, if there's enough fish on that reef, they can clean away that quote unquote bad algae and allow coral colonies to return. So it is kind of an ecosystem effect here. But enough said, if you warm the waters around a coral reef for a long period of time, they will bleach and eventually they will die out. And if there's not a really strong ecological system there to remove that bad algae, they will never grow back. There's been a lot of studies lately on looking at coral reef and sunscreens. Between six and 14,000 tons of sunscreens released into corals per year by tourists and things like that. 10% of the world's reefs in a few studies were shown to be threatened by sunscreen. What happens is during the breakdown of those UV filters in the sunscreen, it releases reactive oxygen species. This interferes with a photosynthetic process in the symbiotic algae, so it can cause bleaching that way. Some areas are expected to have more rain and others less. Water quality might improve in rainy regions, and it might get worse in dry ones through dilution effects. It also depends on what's in the runoff. So even if you have a lot more rain, you don't necessarily have better water quality. It depends what's going into that water. It might be leaching in toxic minerals from elsewhere. The snowpack runoff earlier leads to big water challenges, especially in places that don't have an adequate reservoir system to capture that runoff as it comes down the mountains. Higher temperatures will lead to more evaporations from existing lakes, ponds, etc. For example, in the 1998 natural El Nino, naturally warm year because the equatorial Pacific was anomalously warm, that aided in lowering the Great Lakes by about two feet. So warmth can really drag down by evaporation the level of lakes. More thermal stratification can also lead to less mixing. So just like shutting off weak upwelling zones by cooking the top level of the water column, you can have the same effect in lakes and ponds by causing increased thermal stratification, which won't allow nice mixing in the lake or pond, and it also changes the distribution of biology in there. 
As an example, if you warm surface water, that could force some species of plankton that prefer cold water or grow better in cold water lower in the water column. That moves them away from the light that they need to photosynthesize. As a result, you might expect less plankton and less food for fish. And so that's just one example of how that might happen. Certain fish in small bodies of water might just die. There's nowhere to run. So this is an effect not just in small bodies of water where fish are trying to get in the colder and colder spots to match their biology. This is an effect in mountains too, where species are going up the sides of mountains trying to seek colder and colder temperatures as the earth warms. Eventually they're going to run out of mountain to find a colder air. Key points from chapter 13, and obviously we can't cover all effects of life from increasing climate change, but we try to cover the basics here. Individual plants may grow faster with more CO2. But the ecosystem response to CO2 and climate change, like temperature and moisture, is harder to determine. Tropical pests and disease will probably spread poleward, however. Speciation will change both on land and in water in response to climate change. Extinction rates will increase as many plants and animals will not be able to migrate or adapt as quickly as climate is changing. The past has shown us big extinctions happen when climate changes. It could be worse today because there's also added complications like forest dissection. Ocean acidification, which you'll see in the next meta lesson, is occurring, as is coral bleaching. The general changes in the water cycle expected are for the subtropical zones to dry out, the deep tropics and the upper latitudes that generally have more precipitation and overall heavier precept rates when it rains with longer dry periods in between. So this is going to stress agriculture and it could change mosquito populations and a variety of other things.